Well, it is uh, six o'clock on the dot, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I know folks will probably keep trickling in. Um, but good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Hugo, and I'm Sea Grant's South Atlantic Reef Fish Extension and Communication Fellow. Um, and I've kind of been the organizer for this three-part webinar series. Um, as a reminder, this, this webinar series is really designed to be an educational resource for anyone interested in ongoing reef fish research in the South Atlantic. Um, each webinar will begin and has begun with a guest presentation on a particular research area, followed by a question and answer session. Um, this is the second webinar. So the last webinar was focused on reef fish serving. Um, if you're interested in any webinar but can't attend for whatever reason um, or want to rewatch the webinar, all webinars and are recorded and are now available online. So um, Florida Sea Grant and South Carolina Sea Grant have been kind enough to post them on their YouTube channel. So you can check those out if you're interested. Um, before we begin the presentation tonight, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping things. Um, first of all, GoToWebinar, which is this um, webinar platform we're using, has automatically muted your microphone just to prevent um, kind of overlapping feedback and whatnot. Once our guest speaker finishes tonight, um, we will begin our question and answer session. Um, at that time, my team, my tech support team, and I will unmute participants individually to allow for questions. Um, if you guys are having any difficult technical difficulties at any point during the webinar, please use the chat to let us know. We will work with you um, with troubleshooting and try to get you sorted out. Um, and then one last thing from me, I will go ahead and um, pull up an evaluation link here. Um, so this is a Sea Grant three-part webinar series, like I mentioned. Um, and a big part of this is kind of, it was designed for you all, and we would really like to get feedback on kind of how, how things went. Um, I'll post kind of a QR code at the end of this um, webinar with with the um, that'll link kind of to a poll where you can provide some feedback. But um, for the time being, I'll actually just in the in the chat publicly to everyone. I will go ahead and post the um, link in the chat and just keep that there. If you have time, um, obviously we haven't started anything yet, but um, if you have time at the end of the chat, I would appreciate it. Um, and yeah, that's just about it for me. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our guest speaker tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce the second speaker of this three-part series, Dr. Will Patterson. Um, Dr. Patterson wears many hats. In addition to serving as a marine fisheries ecology professor at the University of Florida, Dr. Patterson is the project lead for the South Atlantic Red Snapper Research Program. Um, this is a project focused on estimating the total abundance of red snapper in South Atlantic waters. Um, Dr. Patterson, thank you so much for being here today. Um, looks like I've got your screen. The floor is all yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much and thanks for the invite to share our project and our progress to date and what we'll be doing over the next year and a half to wrap this up and produce population estimates. Um, so obviously the title of the talk here is Estimation of U.S. Atlantic Red Snapper Abundance. It's a fairly broad study. We have um, three academic institutions, University of Florida, NC State, and Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Um, involved several state agencies uh, up and down the seaboard, and then uh, some of our investigators are with NOAA Fisheries as well. So red snapper is an iconic uh, reef fish in our region. It occurs in the U.S. Atlantic from North Carolina uh, through Florida, and then in the Gulf of Mexico and U.S. waters, and then um, down through Mexican waters um, and, and well known from the Campeche banks in the southern Gulf of Mexico. These fish are fairly long lived. They can live to be about 60 years old and they recruit to fisheries in both regions uh, at about age two to four, uh, depending on growth rates and size at age. But that's about when they start appearing in the various fisheries. Um, there's been a fair amount of research done on the genetic population structure of red snapper. And this paper, um, Dave Portnoy um, et al, uh, that we published uh, last year, shows the locations of red snapper samples in the Atlantic and then throughout the Gulf of Mexico into Mexican waters. And I, I won't get into a lot of the details of this study, but it did show that there was significant population structure um, separating the Atlantic and Gulf populations as two distinct genetic stocks. And that's how they're managed um, by the councils, right? The South Atlantic Council manages Atlantic red snapper and the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council manages um, Gulf red snapper. So again, iconic reef fish have uh, been exploited for um, many decades in both regions going back into the 19th century. 
Atlantic commercial landings peaked in the 1960s, and the recreational peak is estimated to occur in the 1980s. Um, part of that has to do with the data rich period um, starting in the 1980s. Um, but our best estimates are that's when the recreational landings peaked as well. And the Atlantic stock has been estimated to be overfished since the 1980s. Um, the picture on the right is one I pulled from the Council's Citizen Science Initiative um, Fishery, which is a really great program. Uh, if you, you can access it online and, and uh, learn some information about pulling data from historical uh, images. And it's a really cool study and, and great information that's been derived from that. Obviously, there's a lot of frustration uh, among both the commercial and recreational sectors with red snapper uh, management. Um, the recreational season in recent years has been two to three days, and obviously season, seasonal closures um, prior to that, um, fairly small commercial quotas as well. And so you don't have to go very far to find um, disgruntled um, perspectives that, that appear in newspapers or the sport fishing or even commercial fishing uh, literature on, on red snapper. Um, this is actually a cartoon from, from the Gulf, but I thought it was uh, pretty germane to the discussion. And it has to do with perspective. Um, and so this cartoon was published in 2009 and from Jeff Parker, and it shows the you know, sport fishermen saying, hey, the population's huge. And fishery scientists saying, well, actually our estimates are it's about this big. So perhaps this doesn't apply directly to Atlantic red snapper, but maybe maybe it does a bit. Um, and but perhaps with Atlantic red snapper, we should really be talking about discards and dead discards. And the fishery scientists would be saying they're huge, and the sport fishermen would be saying maybe not so big. Um, but anyway, right? We we often have these differences of ideas and pers perspectives um, about what's going on in the water, on the water. So what do the estimates actually show us? So this is from the most recent stock assessment um, in 2021 for Atlantic red snapper. The, the figure in the top left um, shows spawning stock biomass. And so spawning stock biomass was estimated to start declining um, in the 1960s um, through to the 1980s. The horizontal purple line is the biomass at maximum sustainable yield. And these are shown here in relative measures. So 1.0 would be um, BMSY. And then the um, minimum size stock threshold is one half BMSY. So that's the overfished threshold shown in the, in the red line. And you can see during the time period from the early 1980s to present, the stock has been below that overfished threshold. Although since about 2010, the stock is estimated to have been recovering um, pretty substantially over that time period. And, um, you know, if you go back to the 1980s, you can see the stock biomass, at least the egg production, is many, many fold greater than the period when it was the lowest. Um, so the science agrees with the perception that red snapper um, have increased, in, you know, quite substantially over this time period. Um, the figure at the bottom shows fishing mortality. And um, again, the red line here now is, is the overfishing threshold. So F equal to um, FMSY or the fishing rate that produces maximum sustainable yield. And so when you're above this line, you're overfishing. And you can see that you know, through this data rich period of the 1980s forward, the estimates are always above that line. Um, and so how could this be that the stock is recovering um, so we're approaching, a, you know, crossing that overfished threshold to being not overfished, yet we still have overfishing estimated to be occurring. Well, there's a couple things that, that are going on here in the assessment model. First is the age composition of the landings suggests some fairly strong recruitment in the recent time period. So as you add young fish to the population, the population is growing. So um, it's, it's tracking to upward toward BMSY, yet the removals um, have been unsustainably high, estimated through the assessment process. Well, commercial landings peaked in the 1960s, have been declining ever since. Recreational landings um, peaked in the 1980s, and except for a couple of years in the late 2000s, have been fairly low relative to historical landings. 
So how can this be that the total fishing mortality is so great? Well, it has to do with the estimates of dead discards. And we can see that on the right here, the estimated dead discards um, through time. So I'm gonna come back to this um, in a bit, but this issue has caused obviously great frustration. Um, scientifically, we can describe what the model is seeing and how these estimates are performed, but there is uncertainty obviously with the discard data coming through um, the EMRIT program. And um, because of all of this sort of consternation, there was some political pressure and lobbying of Congress to actually do an assessment or an estimate of the population size of red snapper independent of the stock assessment process. And so the South Atlantic Red Snapper Research Program was funded by Congress in 2020. And the first award was for $1.5 million. And so this program comes through Sea Grant and the Sea Grant um, programs among the states on the East Coast from North Carolina to Florida competed to host the award and South Carolina won that competition. And so South Carolina has a great website that details the study that we've been doing. Um, and it's been a really great relationship working with them. And obviously Sea Grant has tremendous extension capabilities. So um, reaching out to the public and demonstrating what the project goals, methods and results um, have been and will continue to be. So the primary objective of this study is to estimate the age two plus uh, red snapper population size in the Atlantic. There have been subsequent congressional appropriations of about 3.3 million that have gone to the South Atlantic Red Snapper Research Program. Um, plus in this last year, there was an additional $900,000 that came through um, this uh, Congress's, um, Congress um, funded this work although it didn't come through South Atlantic Sea Grant, it stayed with NOAA Fisheries, and for about $900,000 to do discard studies to try to start to um, maybe provide other means by which to estimate discards and to try to, mis um, to, try to mitigate discards. I'll just point you to the website at the bottom here. Um, if you haven't seen it yet and you're interested, you can just search South Atlantic Red Snapper Research Program, and you can find this on, um, the South Carolina Sea Grants uh, website. So we were funded in 2020 and um, have received a couple of awards since then to produce two estimates of red snapper population size. And I'll talk about those in a minute. So we have a, a fairly large team. Um, in the top row, the folks in the left, these are all University of Florida. Uh, Dave Portnoy and his um, collaborators or our collaborators at Texas A&M Corpus Christi, Dave leads the genetics and genomics component of our study. Um, Jeff Buckle and a team of scientists at NC State University. Um, and uh, Jeff heads up the Bayesian hierarchical modeling component, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, Bev Sauls, Dominique Lazar, and Ted Schweitzer are at um, FWC, Florida FWC. They've been tremendous in providing fin clip tissue samples and. Um, I'll talk about their contributions again in a bit. Um, Nate Batchelor heads up the CFIS program as part of SURFS, the Southeast Reef Fish Survey, and Wally Bubbly um, at South Carolina DNR heads up the MarMap and South Atlantic CMAP programs that together CFIS and these programs that Wally leads at South Carolina DNR make up the SURFS program, which are important data sources for our estimation. Um, Kyle Scherzer is the lead assessment scientist um, at NOAA Fisheries for Atlantic Red Snapper. Um, so I don't have time to go through, you know, one by one, but, you know, really diverse team, lots of different skills here. Um, and it really great to have the diversity of academic scientists, state scientists, and federal scientists all working together toward this goal. It's not unlike the CEDAR process, you know, CEDAR oftentimes is depicted in the press as a NOAA product or NIMS, you know, NOAA fisheries. But in fact, CEDAR is a collaboration among um, scientists that come from, you know, NGOs, that come from academic institutions, that come from um, federal and state agencies, and also stakeholders that participate uh, in the process. So, you know, all of us who have participated in CEDAR know it's not a NIMS product, but it's a CEDAR product that's this collaboration 
Um, and again, our, our study is very similar in that respect. So what are the objectives um, of our study? Um, first is to estimate the distribution and density of red snapper across the US Atlantic Shelf from North Carolina through the Florida Keys with remotely operated vehicles in unknown or unconsolidated habitats. And this was particularly important because of the red snapper study in the Gulf of Mexico, particularly in the Western Gulf of Mexico, a, a large percentage of the fish estimated to occur there were found in unconsolidated habitats that there wasn't a nearby reef uh, in those samples. And so we wanted to explore that in, in the Atlantic. Um, I will say that in Florida waters, um, I led the Florida component of the, of the Gulf study, um, we didn't find red snapper away from reefs. They were always associated with structure of some sort. Um, the second component of our study or objective was to develop a hierarchical Bayesian integrated abundance model to estimate age two plus red snapper population size based on the Southeast Reef Fish Survey SURFs, uh, trap camera data, and ROV survey data. Um, so, you know, lots of big words here. Basically, we want to create a model to use the camera data and the trap data, I mean, camera data coming from cameras on traps as well as the ROV survey data to produce an estimate of red snapper population abundance. Um, the RFP, the request for proposals, uh, only had this third objective listed, um, which was to conduct a genetic close kin mark recapture analysis to estimate age two plus red snapper population size. So a little bit later, I'll talk to you about the basics of what close kin mark recapture is um, and where we are with that. And then lastly, an objective um, that we felt was really important was to plan at the outset to integrate slash reconcile our study results with the Atlantic Red Snapper Stock Assessment Model. So I'm a member of the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council's Scientific and Statistical Committee, and we've had a tough time trying to utilize the results of the Snapper study, population estimation study in the Gulf, to actually translate that to management. Um, and so having come through that process as an investigator and as an SAC member, I knew it was really important for us to get ahead of this and to plan um, well in advance to best use the information that um, you know, Congress has allocated taxpayer funds to produce these estimates. Okay, so about the actual work. Um, the first thing that we did, and this was led by Paul Roderhausen and um, Jeff Buckle at NC State, was to conduct fishermen interviews. And if um, fishermen are, are on the call here, that participated in this. Thank you very much. It's been a tremendous amount of information gathered. Um, the objectives were to increase the knowledge of hard bottom habitat distribution in the US Atlantic from North Carolina to Florida. And the second then was to estimate the spatial distribution of fishing effort and relative catch rates of commercial red snapper fishermen. Um, and so the approach was to um, go and meet with, with uh, fishermen and show them the map um, on the right, and we had three different regions of the U.S. Atlantic coast, and the, the shelf was gridded like you see here, and we, we asked fishermen to um, indicate areas where they had high, medium, and low um, effort for reef fish, and then high, medium, and low um, catches of red snapper. And so um, COVID-19 complicated this in the, in the first year of the study, um, and so we had to mail questionnaires with these maps. Um, and we had three maps, one to indicate where reef habitat exists, two fishing effort um, that they have, they, they um, focus toward reef fishes, and then three relative catch rates of red snapper um, in the region. And so we've had um, a couple dozen, uh, nearly three dozen now surveys completed um, in this region. And it's added tremendously to our database of known har bottom habitat in the region. Thankfully, um, most areas where fishermen have said this is where habitat occurs, reef habitat, this is where we fish. Um, Nate Batchelor, in his his uh, universe um, of hard bottom sites within the sampling frame from North Carolina through the Keys, he already had a, a fair, a fairly solid idea. Um, so no no big surprises there, but still adding to our knowledge base and a great example of cooperative research 
um, that's been tremendous uh, working with that particular stakeholder group. So the SURF survey, um, every year, somewhere between you know, about 1,400 and 2,000 samples are collected on the shelf, again, by the CFIS program, the South Carolina DNR MARMAP program, as well as the South Atlantic CMAP um, program. And um, so uh, cameras are deployed in, in recent years. Uh, cameras are mounted to the, excuse me, traps are deployed, uh, these Chevron traps. Um, and then we have cameras mounted as well to estimate, um, uh, get to optical estimates of, of reef fish present in the system. And the MARMAP data go back farther, but since 2011, where we have CFIS and MARMAP, we have a much more comprehensive um, area of the shelf. In 2020, there were no samples collected in that year due to COVID restrictions um, on vessels. So the red dots on the map on the right show you this time period of 12 years and the sample sites that were visited with these uh, camera trap um, gear. Um, this is a paper that Nate Batchelor um, is uh, actually, so this is an internal review, which it should be submitted in the next day or two. Um, but on the left-hand side, you can see the catch rates um, in blue in the traps and then the standardized video counts in the orange. And so we have this increasing trend in both um, data sets, right? The scale is a little bit different um, on each of the uh, y, the left versus the right y axis, because we see more fish, count more fish than actually go in the traps. But importantly, the two trends match pretty well. And then the shaded areas are just the confidence intervals around those estimates. So in 2021, the last assessment only had these data through 2019, but you can see a continued track upward for this really important fishery independent data source in the assessment. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, a plot from um, Nate's paper that shows the structured habitat as a percentage of the, the bottom coverage from zero to 100. And then we have standardized trap catch on the, on the left y-axis and standardized video count in orange on the right um, y-axis. And you can see this sort of dome-shaped curve where red snapper tend to prefer bottom that has some structured habitat, but not 100% structured habitat. And we think the reason for this is because red snapper forage away from reefs, right? They don't feed on damsel fishes or cardinal fishes. Um, they feed mostly on um, crabs and shrimps and benthic fishes that are away from reefs, and then they come back to the reefs to seek cover. Um, but they're foraging away from reefs or in the water column. Um, and so they like to have areas where there's some hard bottom, but then there's some sand in between. Um, and that's what our uh, the data sh here show. This plot is a heat map. Um, on the left are the trap catch data. On the right are the video data. And the yellow um, color indicates the highest intensity, so highest trap catch or highest uh, video sum count. And so you can see here off of Northeast Florida, we have a clear center of abundance that's now moving up the coast here into, into Georgia. Um, another center of abundance um, off of North Carolina that's um, not quite as high as what we see off Northeast Florida into Georgia. And then in an area in between um, into South Carolina and Southern North Carolina where um, we don't have nearly as much red snapper. Um, now, what I want to say here is right, these are these are fishery independent data, um, but the way the map is constructed to show the heat map, um, it sort of smears across areas where we have known hard bottom and areas where there isn't hard bottom. So it may be a little bit misleading in that respect. Um, so the the map is showing the entire shelf, but really the sampling for surfs. Um, only occurs in areas of hard bottom habitat. Um, for the ROV surveys, uh, again, we've engaged in cooperative research. We've had tremendous cooperation. I think we're up to 19 different um, charter boat captains and, and, and crews and their vessels that we've utilized from Key West all the way up to um, Oregon Inlet, North Carolina. Um, I have most of the boats on here. There are a couple that, that um, I, I just uh, didn't have the pictures for to put this together, but I, I got them this afternoon. I just didn't have time to incorporate them. 
Um, so if you've helped us and your boat's not here, my apologies. Um, we, we do a lot of work with, with um, for hire um, uh, charter boat captains in the Gulf of Mexico as well. And the reason for that with our refish work is because these boats, you know, they're on the grounds every day. Um, they're making, you know, the first step in the scientific process is observation. So they're a great resource for observations that are occurring on the, on the water. Um, but also when we, report, when we deploy our, our ROVs, um, these captains are used to holding on a spot, right? Most of them fish without setting an anchor. So um, they're able to hold on a spot and we're able to do an ROV survey. We can drop the ROV on the bottom and within 10 or 15 minutes, the ROV is back on the deck and we're moving to the next spot. So it makes us very nimble and efficient um, and we utilize their expertise um, in this process. So it's, it's been a great relationship. Um, this is our ROV in the top left. It's a Video Ray Pro 4. We have a camera on the top of it, um, a GoPro that's angled at 45 degrees toward the seabed. And then we have paired cameras. These are stereo cameras. So one is inset about 10 degrees and they're about 60 centimeters apart. Um, mounted onto this uh, aluminum um, pole that doesn't have any flex to it. And so because of the this uh, stereo camera arrangement, we can scale the fish that we see. So for red snapper, we tend to be able to estimate the size for about 20% of the fish that we see. Um, at each site, we drop this um, uh, uh, instrument on the left. Um, it was referred to as a gizmo once by uh, one of the charter boat folks we work with in the Gulf of Mexico. So I have a hard time not saying gizmo, but uh, it's an instrument. This is a, a CTD, measures dissolved oxygen, temperature, salinity, um, and depth. Um, has some other parameters it can measure, but those are the main ones we're interested in here. So the ROV is tethered to the surface and we have a control box um, where Joe Tarnecki, our, our, our ROV pilot, flies the ROV. And then this just shows a transect um, this is off Northeast Florida along this little ledge. Um, so you can see some nice reef habitat here. A couple of lionfish show up. Um, Tom Tate, uh, we'll see an angelfish here in a minute, along with uh, some gray snapper and vermilion snapper. All right, so you can see the angelfish um, just swim by there. And we get to the very end, we're going to see a couple of red snapper um, enter the frame. So this is what a typical um, ROV transect would look like. I'm not going to run through a bunch of video, but we've had great visibility um, in the system during this during during our work here um, with these optical gears. So um, the ROV sampling that we've conducted, we did in summer of 21 through the summer of 23. So we we were um, announced that we were funded in the spring of 21 and within a few weeks we were already conducting rov surveys um, joe is great at what he does and we had a crew already in place so we were we were able to hit the ground running and uh, most of the surveys were done in summer of 21 and 22. there were a few surveys that we had to conduct in the summer of 23 um, because uh, weather issues late in summer of 22 just kept us from them um, so in total, these randomly selected sites uh, along the shelf, we have 282 that have been done, again, from the Keys all the way through north of um, uh, Oregon Inlet. And you can see the red circles here are the observations of red snapper. So very few red snapper observed during, during these ROV surveys, although we did paired sampling on known hard bottom sites with the camera traps. We clearly picked up red snapper. So we know from work that we've done in the Gulf that red snapper don't tend to avoid the ROV. Um, and we count them when they're present. It's just on these sites, which were mostly unconsolidated sandy bottoms, we just didn't see red snapper. So the figures on the right again are from uh, Nate Bachelor's paper. The top row shows the proportion of ROV stations where we observed red snapper. The bottom row shows the mean density, and this is individuals per 100 square meters. And then on the left column, we have the structured habitat as a percentage. And then we have a measure which we call habitat complexity. So one is the least complex habitat, and three is the most complex habitat. So, and then the sample sizes are across the top. So among our 282 stations, 
we had 197 that had no structured habitat, 24 that had a little bit of structure. We didn't see any red snapper in either of those. Um, among the stations where we had a, a moderate amount, we saw the most red snapper, about 20% of those we saw red snapper, and then the drop off as we got to um, higher um, percentage of structured habitat on, on the seabed. And this again matches the data from the surf's analysis, uh, the, the analysis of the surf's data um, that I showed you a, a little bit ago. Um, red snapper tend to prefer more, more complex hard bottom. So, you know, higher structure, more, more um, relief, greater relief, greater complexity, uh, but they just don't want it continuous. They like to have sand uh, in between. So um, a big component of our study is also doing fin clip sampling. And this supports um, the genomic analysis. And, and so just briefly how this works, we, we, uh, we sample the catch, uh, the landed catch. Um, and so really intense efforts um, by various groups uh, along the East Coast and, and FWC in, in particular does a tremendous job getting thousands of samples um, every year of fin clips. We take a, a clip of the dorsal fin, we put it into a solution called DMSO. It's buffered, it's very stable and it's really easy to ship around the country we could put the fin clips in ethanol but that's more problematic for shipping and once we have this fin clip we have the dna of the fish and we could do anything from examining population structure um, which again dave's recent paper and then analysis from the current study um, that's ongoing we can do close kin mark recapture so look at the genetic relatedness uh, among our samples and the more relatives that we see in a, in a given number of samples, that means the lower the population size. Um, we can also do epigenetic aging, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, and we can, um, well, shortly we'll be able to determine the sex. Um, Dave has a Salt and Stahl Kennedy grant, which we're working with him on um, to do genetic sex ID of red snapper and some other species. Uh, for which we can't tell the sex um, and, uh, externally. We'd have to cut the fish open. And we want non-lethal non methods. And so these fin clips provide non-lethal methods to allow us to do all of these things. Um, so the fin clip sampling for genomic analyses, uh, the sample sizes are shown on the left. So between 6,100 and nearly 7,000 fish sampled in our three years. Um, we have fishery independent, we have recreational, the commercial landings, we have discards sampled by FWC. Um, each year we get a couple thousand samples from surfs and the fish that come up in their traps. Um, North Carolina and Georgia have been sampling directly as well. So a really tremendous job across uh, a range of uh, academic and um, federal and state agency scientists here. It's a really tremendous effort. On the front end, we did simulation analysis to estimate the number of fin clip samples we would need to produce population estimates using CKMR with a CV of 0.3 or less. And our estimates were that we'd have to have at least 2,500 samples per year. We felt fairly confident that we could get 2,500. We weren't quite sure how many we could get, but we knew we could get 2,500, and we've exceeded that almost threefold. Um, so tremendous effort among our team to produce these samples. And, and thanks to all the commercial fish houses and recreational fishers on the dock. I know, especially if you have a two day season, the last thing you want is to be pulling your boat out with all the activity at the ramp and have scientists you know, ask you for access to your fish. Um, we get told no sometimes, but uh, many, many folks uh, agreed to allow us to take otoliths or ear stones and fin clips um, and it's a really, really tremendous um, effort, you know, to um, make time and, and spend some time there at the end of a long day. Again, with all the other frustrations of the boat ramp and, you know, issues about red snapper management that are frustrating folks, um, we're really appreciative of, of getting access to the fish to get these important samples. So what is this epigenetic aging deal? Well, um, in the DNA molecule of fish, there are certain loci, CPG sites, um, and for those of you who know a bit about DNA, this is the basis cytosine next to guanine. And so where this occurs, we can have 
um, a methyl um, group attached to the surface of the DNA molecule. It doesn't really affect um, the, the coding of the DNA, um, but this methylation can occur in the positive direction, and so um, regions can become methylated with age, and other regions can become demethylated with age. But there's, it's been shown across a wide range of species, including humans, that if you can go into the DNA and do the sequencing and figure out which of these methylated um, sites are highly correlated with age, you can build a model that can then predict age for other samples for which you only have the DNA. So I have a couple of um, studies demonstrating this here that um, Nick Weber, a PhD student and Dave Portnoy's lab, um, this is part of his dissertation research, really sharp work. So at the top, we have red snapper and red grouper. And then for red snapper and red grouper, we have otolith derived ages. Um, there's been validation studies for both of these and the otoliths are fairly clear and easy to read. And then we have the epigenetic age prediction. So we built an epigenetic model and then predicted age for these samples. And you can see that this, this dotted line is the line of perfect agreement and our samples line up right on that line. Um, down below is the most recent work um, that we've done on this. Um, and so this is a paper that Nick has that was um, just accepted in the Canadian Journal, should be out in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, and so we have the epigenetic clock predicted age on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have delta C14 validated otolith age. So these were consensus ages. We had two readers, and then we had, we used the islands core for the birth year um, signal using bomb radiocarbon. And we, you can see the really tight agreement here for this species. Um, and, and so, and for all three of these species, this epi, these epigenetic clocks produce age estimates that are more precise, that are actually more accurate, they're faster and cheaper than doing otolith aging. Um, and the, the perhaps the, the, the best um, deal here is that they're all non-lethal. So we're able to take a fin clip and then estimate the age of the fish. So about 1,000 to nearly 2,000 fish per year in our study have come from recreational discards that FWC scientists have been collecting. And we need to have the age estimate for the fish in order to use it in the CKMR process. So now we have this tool which we can utilize to estimate fish age. So what is CKMR, right? So close kin, so kinship, relatedness of individuals. And then the mark recapture, so we're using this genetic mark. Um, and this has been utilized, the Australians um, have been doing this work for about a decade now. And the um, first really large scale study that has been published on this is in Southern Bluefin Tuna, so in the Pacific Ocean. And the bottom shows a biopsy punch that the Australian scientists, uh, scientists at CSIRO utilized to collect DNA samples. Um, but in the US, there hasn't been a, a CKMR study um, on this on this scale, at least, um, before Atlantic Red Snapper. So we actually proposed doing this for Gulf Red Snapper, um, but um, the committee in the Gulf at the time um, wasn't wasn't quite sure that this would be an appropriate approach, or otherwise didn't feel that confident in utilizing it. So we we didn't use they they selected they opted not to to fund anything on CKMR. But luckily for us. In the Atlantic, it was part of the RFP. So we were able to propose doing it. And again, um, we're looking for half siblings predominantly, so two fish that share a uh, mother or a father. And the color pattern that you see here, the, the grays are snapper that aren't related. And then the fish that have that share the same color are ones that are half siblings, which we can identify using these genetic techniques. Um, and genomic analyses. So on the right-hand side, we have many more half-sibling pairs. And so for that sample, we would estimate that the population would be uh, smaller than the population on the left. So I don't really have time to get into all the various components of the, the modeling that's utilized in the CKMR process, but 
the essence of it is here. We're looking for genetic relatedness. The more relatedness we find, the more um, half sibling pairs that we find uh, for a given sample, the lower the population estimate. Um, now there are others, there's some other components that go into this, um, growth rates, um, fecundity at age. Um, and so we're doing some simulation work. So Dave Shigaris and Liam Kehoe um, are working with Eric Anderson and Chris Hollenbeck um, to figure out exactly how much uncertainty we might have given the variance in, in these various life history estimates. Um, but we should be able to build that into our final estimate so we can fully and accurately convey the uncertainty um, in our estimates. And then round three funding from the South Atlantic um, Red Snapper Research Program, uh, we got funding to do two things. One is to test through simulation analysis, um, conventional and gene tagging approaches to estimating the magnitude of discards. So we have all of this great genomic resources that Dave Portnoy's group has developed at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. So we wanna mobilize that and utilize um, all of the sequencing data they've produced it's a tremendous amount of information we know about the red snapper genome now to estimate um, the level of discarding that's occurring in the region. And so um, Liam and Dave Shigaris are uh, leading the um, this um, tag simulation work. And we had a workshop last summer in Cedar Key. We're gonna have another workshop this spring to um, circle back and talk about the results um, that were put into place after the methods that were put into place after our initial workshop. And hopefully by the next time, um, if there is a next time of South Atlantic Red Snapper um, funding available, we'll at least be able to contribute. This is what it's gonna take to do gene tagging to estimate discards or what it would take to do this with conventional tagging. Another component of our, this third round of funding is to um, derive better estimates of what the effective sample area, the ESA is, of the camera traps. So the ROV has a benefit in that it moves along the seabed, but the traps are stationary and they're baited. So we're pulling in fish from a given area and then we're counting those fish with the cameras. And, and so that abundance count is important and we can use it as a relative measure, but to get an absolute measure, we need to estimate the density of fish in a given area. So we have to know how, what area the fish are being pulled from. So we did this off North Carolina this past summer. We'll do it off Northeast Florida the coming summer. We deploy um, acoustic receivers in an array that's um, you know, several square kilometers up to 20 square kilometers, some of the arrays that we have in the Gulf of Mexico, and that will deploy off of Northeast Florida. And then you can see in the bottom right, here's a red snapper, this tag number. Um, is uh, number 53, and then we have the acoustic tag. So these acoustic tags have depth sensors, and the receivers are placed um, in an array such that we can get the XY um, position estimate of the fish, and then we can get the depth or the Z dimension of the fish based on the um, pressure sensor in the tag. So we can map fish movement and location in three dimensions. So whenever a trap was deployed at a given spot, we'll know which tagged fish were around that area. And we can do an analysis called spatial capture recapture. Um, and Nathan Hostetter and uh, Krishna Pacifica at NC State um, are leading um, that analysis. So our last component is then integrating the red snapper population estimates from these two approaches. Um, so I didn't really get into the hierarchical modeling. Um, it's probably too complicated for um, trying to fit in all this other information, but we're utilizing the ROV data and the camera trap data, estimating density of fish and then scaling that up to the full population, uh, the full region um, area. And so we'll have then two estimates, one derived from this hierarchical modeling and one derived from the CKMR to utilize in the red snapper um, assessment. So there's a there's um, a research track assessment or a benchmark assessment that's gonna occur in 2025. Um, and we're gonna either utilize one of two approaches, right? The simplest approach is just to scale the current population estimate 
or the produced population estimate from the assessment to these externally derived population abundance estimates plus their uncertainty. Um, however, more elegant and better approach would be to integrate the new data and the population estimation, so the CKMR analysis, for example, directly into the assessment model. So Matt Damiano is um, funded through a Marfin grant, um, working with Kyle Scherzer, who's the PI of the project, and, and um, both are members of our research team to incorporate this estimation process um, into the assessment model. Now, Matt has recently um, been hired in a permanent position at NOAA Fisheries. So the personnel and staffing, how this actually gets accomplished um, may change a little bit over the next year or so, but we're working now to have this in place. So a year from now, when the assessment starts to um, move forward, this has already um, been done on the front end so we can do this integration um, fairly seamlessly. That's, that's the goal. So where are we in our study um, um, timeline? So, you know, lots of moving parts here. You know, we have ROV surveys, we got camera trap sampling, we have fin clip sampling, we had uh, the um, genetic and genomic analyses, um, panel development, do the sequencing. So broad, complex, multidisciplinary team. I'm happy to report that we're at or ahead of schedule in all of our various components. Um, and so our goal is to have by next summer to have population estimates so they'll be ready to go into um, into the stock assessment as that process move forward. So our report is due in summer of, of 25. So I, I said next summer, meaning not summer of 24, um, but summer of 25. And then there'll be a process of peer review. Um, from the Atlantic SSC, um, as well as uh, from the South Atlantic SSC, as well as a Center for Independent Experts external review. So we've built all of that into our process. Um, and again, we're on schedule and we hope to remain there. Um, so far, so good as we move forward in producing these estimates to integrate into the assessment model. So Lots of folks um, contributed to our success to date. Um, don't have time to read through all these individually, but in particular, South Carolina Sea Grant has been great to work with. Um, the technical reviews um, have been beneficial to our, to our work, and the steering committee has also been um, really easy to, to work with and, and uh, you know, gather their feedback and make adjustments as needed. Um, and again, there's a few fishermen um, charter boat captains that, that we've worked with that, that unfortunately didn't make this list, but we thank everybody who's helped us on the water and we really appreciate um, both our study team and, and how dedicated folks have been, but also the stakeholders um, and, and the various agencies um, contributing their you know, time and effort. Uh, it's been really, really, really tremendous. And that's it for me. Perfect. Thank you so much, Will. Um, for those of you who are interested, I actually just pasted that um, South Carolina Sea Grant website in the chat as well, so feel free to check that out. Um, it's got a lot of really awesome information, of kind of high-level information about the project, but really appreciate it, Will. Um, we're going to go ahead and move into the question and answers portion of this webinar. Um, it looks like we've had a question kind of asked midway through the webinar, um, so Will, if you don't mind just leaving the slides up real quick. Um, Janelle Fleming asked, um, and Janelle, you might have to speak up or in the chat clarify what graph you're referring to, but um, you said with these graphs, are they cumulative or does it appear that you have more samples from North Carolina versus SURFs, FWCCOM with the second graph of the fin clip sampling? Um, I have a general idea what slide you're referring to, but if you don't mind, um, we can actually unmute you or you can feel free to type in the chat um, to just clarify what graph you're talking about. guess let's see so i i heard yeah i part of the question had to do with the serfs so i assume this is the figure in question i believe so yes um 
So, so the cumulative, one, the one thing that um, I'll just point out here is, so the, the surveys, um, the, the SURF's complete database, and then also, you know, CFIS and independently MarMap and um, CMAP South Atlantic. Um, the, the survey is focused on reef habitat. So areas where you see clusters of data points, that's where there's clusters of, of reef habitat. And it's no um, coincidence then that you have centers of abundance that occur for a reef fish like red snapper in those areas where you have more predominant um, natural hard bottom. So the way the surveys are conducted um, is, you know, Nate has um, in his sample frame, there are a few thousand natural hard bottom sites. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact, the exact number off the top of my head. And then in a given year, they randomly select, you know, it's like 15 to 1800, depending on the, the, the boat days they have that year. Um, and so Wally's group does a portion of those samples, mostly in sort of the central part of the range. Um, and then the NOAA ships like the Pisces are used to do work off North Carolina, and then they move down south um, and go all the way down to um, south of Canaveral um, on, on the east coast, so um, uh, Port Lucy. Um, so uh, that's why the distribution looks as it does. It's reflective of where the known hard bottom habitat is. Perfect. And um, just kind of a logistical thing, for those of you who want to ask a question um, verbally, um, feel free to kind of raise your hand in the sidebar panel. There should be just a hand icon. You can click on that and then um, my team will kind of unmute you and allow for questions after I announce you. Um, you can also type it in the question sidebar as well. Um, but it looks like we've got Bob Zales raising his hand. So we will go ahead and unmute you, Bob, and um, let you ask your question. Bob, you should be able to unmute on your end. You just need to click that little microphone icon. All right, looks like you may be unmuted, Bob. Try, try asking your question real quick. All right, I'm not seeing, not hearing anything. Maybe you can put it in the chat. Yeah, Bob, do you mind just typing it in the chat real quick? It looks like he might have lost internet connection. I'm seeing as he's offline. Okay. Okay. Well, we will, Bob, you're on standby. Um, anyone else, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand or type them in the chat and we will get to them kind of one by one. All right. Looks like Liz has a question. Should be good to unmute. Yep, Hi, can you, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, awesome. Um, so I had a question on the close kin mark recapture. Um, do you could guys define a region where you compare um, the genomics from the half siblings, or do you just consider the entire like region that you're, um, you know, sampling like in this map, that entire region, or it, or is it like at specific sampling sites? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so population structure has, as you might imagine, a really important, a really important implications here for using CKMR and and how the connectivity, um, you know, population connectivity that exists in the system. So. From the outset, the sample frame is defined as the Keys all the way up to North Carolina, and um, the and and we get a, a few samples from South Florida. Uh, you know, ROV sampling was pretty intense, uh, intensive in the Keys, and we saw a couple of fish. Um, but 
The catch rates are fairly low in the Keys and then off of Southeast Florida as well. Um, so we don't have a lot of fin clips from, from those regions, uh, nor do we have uh, you know, any indication that there are a lot of unsampled red snapper down there. Um, but as far as the, the core region then, um, from you know, about the central east coast of Florida up to just north of Hatteras there, um, the first thing that we'll do in this work uh, that, that Portnoy and his group will do is examine the population connectivity from the genomics data. So we'll actually be able to test whether there's significant population structure that exists across this region. Right. There have been a little bit of tagging data, and then there's some otolith chemistry data, a study that um, Beverly Barnett was the lead on a few years ago um, that showed you know, movement across this region from adults um, or by adults, post-settlement movement. And then you also have larval transport, right? So as um, the Gulf Stream is moving up the East Coast, you have transport um, that could occur across that region. So there's plenty of opportunity for connectivity. Um, the Portnoy et al. 2022 paper uh, had much greater sample intensity, sampling intensity in the Gulf of Mexico, and um, the Atlantic was almost like an outgroup in that analysis, but there was significant structure between the Gulf and the Atlantic. In this study, we'll have a much more um, comprehensive um, data set um, to examine population structure, genetic population structure in the Atlantic. Um, there have, there's been some simulation work done by Paul Kahn um, looking at CKMR and the effect of misidentifying what the population components are, what the population structure is. So, for example, if we had genetically distinct populations off of North Carolina versus Northeast Florida, and we didn't account for that in our CKMR analysis, then that could cause a bias in our estimate. Um, now, I'm not saying we've we found that type of structure and the earlier analyses suggest that there's not that type of difference between the two, but we'll be able to test that in a more comprehensive way and then account for it by doing you know, separate modeling if it's if it's present. Um, but the null hypothesis is that there's no structure, um, that it's one continuous genetic stock on the East Coast. OK, thank you. All right, looks like Bob um, wrote his question in the chat. Um, I will go ahead and read it. It's a very good presentation. I assume this is not part of your research, but we all know that a discard mortality is a big issue with determining stock status, and the recreational data is a big problem with recreational discards and resulting mortality. Um, I guess the next part is, are there efforts in the South Atlantic and Gulf to better address this problem? Um, Will a recommendation come from you all to have NOAA better address recreational harvest and discard data? So, so I guess it's multi multi part. Yeah, a couple of different components there. Um, there have been some studies done in the Atlantic to estimate red snapper discard mortality, and the estimates in the assessment are are fairly low. Um, and uh, Jeff Buckle has a student who's working on this off of North Carolina presently to estimate discard mortality rates using three-dimensional telemetry. So, and, and we've done some work with three-dimensional telemetry in my lab in the Gulf, um, Aaron Bohoboy's dissertation research, uh, fairly comprehensive, and then with some assessment simulations um, on top of her empirical estimates. Um, so there's quite a bit of information out there about red snapper discard mortality and there will be more um, specific to this region um, in the next couple of years in this study when, when we're deploying these large-scale um, telemetry arrays our goal is to put fish back in the water alive so we're not doing any type of controlled studies where we release them at the surface without venting or um, everything is going back with a center device because we want to be able to track the fish on the bottom so it can inform our analysis of the effective sampling area of the camera traps. So in that case, we're, we're not actually going to be estimating release mortality um, for those. We will be able to, in some fairly small areas, be able to estimate what the discard rates are because we can see fish being pulled up and then released um, through the array. 
and then we also have um, reward tags on on the um, there's conventional tags as well that allow us to get information when people catch and release our our, our fish. Um, so it it's an important question. It's just not something that's a focus of this broader study. All right, our next question is, uh, looks like Jonathan O'Brien has his hand raised. We'll go ahead and try to unmute you. Jonathan, we should be able to hear you now. Yeah, does everyone got me? Yep, perfect. All right, so um, all right. So, quick question, Will. Thanks for the uh, presentation. Appreciate your uh, due diligence and work. I guess the uh, question I want to hear a response to, if there is a response, is to some of the NOAA um, feedback from some NOAA faulty data regarding red snapper in the southeast Atlantic. And I don't know if that also goes to the Gulf, but some of the kickback here in the South Carolina, Charleston area about uh the data that's being represented versus um i don't know how it was obtained is it's not accurate we've seen a lot of kickback here in the commercial and charter fishing industry so just curious to see what you guys might have to say about that well i'm, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to i mean there's a tremendous amount of different data and data sources that go into the stock assessment um so what specific estimates are are you referring to um i don't have the article in front of me but a lot of our uh sc uh red snapper frustration frustrations come from a local paper that discusses um some of the limits or shortening of of even the grouper uh fishery um but it also ties into some of the red snapper fishery just curious to see if you guys had any any interest or, or any feedback for it. I guess what I'm saying is we have a lot of people here, uh, recreational, uh, commercial charter guys that are saying there's a lot of them here, but then a lot of the data that the the researchers say is that they're not here. Yeah, so um, the stock assessment estimates are pretty clear that the population size and the egg production and the stock has increased tremendously over this time period of more intensive regulations. And you know, 2010 is an important year. Um, 2007, you had the reauthorized Magnuson-Stevenson Act, uh, Magnuson-Stevenson Act that that um, required that you know overfishing could no longer exist in any fishery. So if a fishery was estimated to be overfishing, then you know you had to have a plan in place to mitigate that um, and so annual catch limits and annual catch targets became part of that process um, and and you can see the stock responding to those efforts um, and so you know this trajectory here um, you can see that you know from 2010 to present right so we go from about you know 0.15 to about 4.5 so a tripling of the spawning stock biomass over that time period. So, you know, when 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 fishermen say um, there are more red snapper out there than I've seen in my lifetime, um, well, you know, most people that are fishing today probably weren't fishing, you know, prior to the 1980s. You know, that's almost 50 years ago. Um, so, yeah, in, in fishing lifetimes, red snapper have made a tremendous comeback. Um, that that doesn't mean that that removals aren't higher than they need to be for recovery and that the recovery is estimated to be fueled by strong recruitment and so you know recruitment is a is a function of population size and and that's that's what's referred to as density dependent um effects but then we also have density independent effects so things that affect recruitment irrespective of the size of the spawning biomass. And those are things like weather patterns or um, upwelling on the East Coast and, and, and climate patterns. So we've had some years where we had really strong recruitment and that's, that's fueling some of this recovery. Um, I think the biggest uncertainty has to do, and, and this is true of the Gulf as well, it has to do with the estimates of recreational landings. And what comes through that process also is the estimates of the discards. And you know, the, the high discard estimates are really what is fueling 
the estimates of, uh, in, especially in the recreational fishery, um, these uh, higher estimates of F, um, you know, estimates that are that are estimated to be above FMSY, is due to the dead discards that come from the large magnitude of discards um, in the system. And so there are approaches that that um, you know NOAA Fisheries just announced um, five or six grants that were funded um, just yesterday. They announced that are focused on discard issues and trying to come up with you know clever ways to mitigate the problems with discards. Um, and and so you know hopefully there will be some solutions there. Um, I, I think you know. Folks in the Gulf and the Gulf Council is frustrated with MRIP and MRIP FES um, and, yeah. and getting more accurate and more precise estimates of what the recreational landings are and, and how come the, um, you know, the MRIP survey gets very different estimates than the let's state reef fish survey in Florida or some of the other surveys in, in the Gulf. Um, so those are things that are, you know, questions and, and issues that that really you know need need some more attention and focus and and fortunately um through congressional appropriations there are now funds to address those um you know more comprehensively but as far as the recovery in the stock you know the 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 stock assessment it sees that recovery um it's the issue is with the, the magnitude of discards and trying to to mitigate that Yes, sir. That's correct. Yeah, no, very good explanation. I, I've got a CCA article that I've I've looked at, but no, you explained it very well. And yeah, obviously the stock's coming back. I fished here for the past 20 years and, and we constantly see these fish increasing, uh, not just in reef structure, but in these barren desert uh, habitats. You know, we've got certain reefs in the South Carolina coast that were put there on purpose to see if uh, reef fish would go there in a desert area bottom sand that you know they do congregate they will move they will show up there and some of the biggest ones ever caught have been there so um i appreciate it i was just curious to see what you had to say thank you certainly all righty um looks like we got a few more in the chat um and yeah i encourage everyone to ask questions um we would kind of prefer to keep them more specific to this exact research pro um, project program excuse me that um, was kind of detailed tonight um and I guess our next question is from Marcus Adams. Um, and this question, let me piece through it real quick. Um, is this study able to catch and release red snapper without mortality and then use use those fish? I think I'm reading that correctly, but. Yeah, so um, we have probably, so of our around 6,500 on average fin clip samples per year, uh, between um, around 1,200 to nearly 2,000 come from regulatory discards. So uh, Florida FWC has a big program where they put observers on four higher recreational vessels and they monitor what the discards are from those vessels. And so if they put their hand on a red snapper, they try to get a tissue sample. And those fish go back in the water and um, sometimes with the center devices, depending on what the captain and crew are, are utilizing. Um, but um, so you know, those fish are, there's still some barotrauma and depending on how deep you are and how big the fish is, you know, that's gonna affect the amount of barotrauma, therefore the, the probability of not surviving that catch and release event. Um, but we try to get as many tissue samples as we can um, because if you know if somebody's putting their hand on a red snapper, we want we want a tissue sample from it. And so Bev Sauls um, has been tremendous and motivating her team at FWC. You know she's she's clearly our MVP when it comes to to fin clips and getting samples. And and everybody at FWC has been just tremendous, from the administrators who you know okayed the personnel time to devote to, to this. To the folks that are squeezing fish and taking samples, um, it's been a really tremendous effort. And because we have this epigenetic tool that Nick Weber and Dave Portnoy have developed at Texas A&M Corpus Christi, we're able to get the age estimate from that tissue sample. So pretty soon we'll be able to tell if it was a boy or a girl. 
Um, we can get the age estimate, and then we can use the DNA to look at population structure up and down the coast. And we can use the DNA and the CKMR analysis to estimate population size. So that non-lethal um, collected fin clip, you know, in the future, um, this I think this study is going to be an important demonstration project, um, not only to you know what can be what's possible with these these um, next generation genomics techniques to think, estimate things like population size, and with gene tags we could uh, potentially eventually estimate the magnitude of discards or fishing mortality rates. Um, and so I think we're going to see a shift over the next five to 10 years in how data are collected and how samples are collected and processed. You know, don't want to say too much along those lines because I'm a little bit biased because my work, my group has been working with Dave on trying to develop these things. But I really see, you know, this being tremendously important in the years ahead. All right, I don't see any more hands in the chat. Looks like we have one more follow-up question from um, Bob Zales. Um, and, and to kind of loosely paraphrase, the question is, will the South Atlantic Red Snapper Research Program include recommendations for future research or recreational data collection efforts? Um, I, I don't think so, Bob. Um, you know, our, our focus is on population estimation and um, you know, the Southeast Regional Office and the Southeast Fisheries Science Center are acutely aware of the uncertainty in the various data sources. You know, unfortunately, Magnuson doesn't say you got to use perfect data and stock assessments. The, the requirement is best available. And, you know, I realize sometimes the data that are available may not be suitable. And then, you know, as an SSC, or as a CDAR committee, you know, things get thrown out all the time. Um, but, you know, the criterion is best available. Um, that doesn't mean that things can't be improved. And there are clearly areas where precision can be improved. And then unfortunately, there's some areas where probably um, we have biased estimates um, that need to be improved. But it's, it's nothing that people aren't aware of and are, are trying hard to push things forward. I know there's a frustration with MRIP and there have been you know, national academy panels um, that have been put together to try to get an, a better system for recreational effort and, and, um, and landings estimates. Um, you know, there's some issues in the Gulf now with, with grouper estimates. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that you know, some bright people can get together and, and push ahead on, on those. I, it's, it's the greatest source of uncertainty. Um, and, and fisheries in, in both regions, I believe, at least for reef fishes. So um, that kind of analysis or that kind of um, suggestion isn't really part of what we're doing here. So I don't foresee us having any recommendations in, in that respect. Um, but you know, I know the center and the regional office are acutely aware of where there are uncertainties in data inputs and um, you know, these are dedicated folks that are working, try, you know, working hard to try to solve it as well. So we have made progress. There's, there's more yet to be made in, in some of the, the data inputs. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Will. Um, I will go ahead and ask, Will, do you mind stopping your screen share? I'm going to just pop up a quick kind of closing slide here. It doesn't look like we have any more questions. It's still shared. Um, I'm still seeing it. Yep. Oh, there we go. All right. All right. Let me try. All right. Can you all, I guess, Will, can you see my slide? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so that do, about does it for the Q&A. Uh, Will, thank you so much for um, presenting. I think it provided a really awesome level of uh, information for us and was also a great follow-up to kind of what Wally Bubbly with South Carolina, South Carolina DNR talked about last webinar. Um, kind of talked a little bit more about even chevron trap sampling and things like that. So it was really neat. Um, just one thing before I let you all go, um, I'll just kind of stress that um, we really do like evaluation at, with these webinars. And so um, if you all don't mind, this is just a QR code up here that links you to a quick one to two minute poll that um, will get, really give us a better idea of, of whether you all learned something, um, whether this webinar met or exceeded your expectations, um, and, and also kind of 
give you the opportunity to to tell us what things you might want to um, know or webinars you might want to see or hear moving forward. Um, and I guess I'll leave that up for a second. It actually looks like we have someone with their hand raised again. So. Um, yeah, I just have a quick question um, before the, well, we got the feedback, which is great. Um, earlier, you said that these um, webinars and the, the presentations can be rewatched. Is there an email that goes out? Or is there a link to rewatch these or, or to watch the presentations again? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, so the if you if you've registered for the webinars, you should be able to access them through GoToWebinar, um, but it's a little bit kind of um, convoluted to get there. So I actually work with Florida Sea Grant and um, South Carolina Sea Grant, and now they are posted on their main YouTube channel. So if you, um, I can actually pull up kind of while people are filling out the evaluation, I can pull up the, um, um, or I guess, I guess you, yeah, you just go onto YouTube and um, Florida Sea Grant or South Carolina Sea Grant has these videos um, or webinars posted there and they'll kind of update with each one. So there was a reef fish serving, which is currently uploaded. This one will probably take a day or two to, to get up there, um, but we'll be up there. Um, and then I guess leading into the next thing, there is one more reef fish webinar on the docket. Um, the next one will be two Tuesdays from now, the same exact time. Um, we'll be joined by Dr. Sean Powers and Dr. Mark Albans with the University of South Alabama, and they will be talking about great amb great, greater amberjack. Um, so we're looking forward to that one. Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and go back to the evaluation slide for anyone who hasn't scanned that. Um, that about does it for us. So I'd like to just one last time thank Will for joining and providing all this really valuable information, and thank you all for attending and, and um, asking some really awesome questions. There is that webinar coming up in two weeks, so I hope to see many of your names again. Um, and that about does it. Thank you all for joining.